everyone. I am Vinita Agarwal, a poet from Bombay. Thank you very much, Gayatri Majumdar, and congratulations on your Brown Critique YouTube channel. It's a pleasure to be uh, talking about this anthology on climate change, and thank you for inviting four other contributors to also talk about uh, their work on the literature of climate change. So, to begin with, I'd like to tell you how this anthology came about. Uh, as a very young girl, I was very connected to nature and I used to be always collecting stones and petals and leaves and filling bags of sand and getting it home and shells and that kind of thing. And obviously that has very little to do with editing an anthology on climate change. But I feel somewhere deep inside that somewhere in my psyche, this anthology began right there and then in that very, uh, very early stage of childhood. To tell you more about the anthology, formally speaking, I was doing a project for G5A, which is a lovely culture space in uh, Mumbai. And I was compiling a set of about 10 poems for them and, and writing about uh, how literature can express and make a difference on this very urgent issue. And as I was reading these poems written by varied authors from all over the world, I felt I deeply resonated with this theme. And I felt that this could be expanded vastly and I would, I would really like to do something bigger with this theme and with the subject. And that's how um, that little project with G5A uh, sort of expanded into this book, Open Your Eyes, an anthology on climate change. It's published by Havakal, and I'm very, very grateful to, uh, to Kiriti Sengupta and Bitan Chakraborty for their support and constant encouragement with this book and for supporting it even post-publication. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to work with Havakal. Uh, I'm very grateful to Ranjit Hoskote, the cultural theorist and eminent poet, for very kindly writing a foreword to the book. It's a very hard-hitting, powerful, brilliant foreword and I would urge all of you to get a copy of Open Your Eyes. It's available on Amazon and on the Havakal website and read this book and also Ranjit's foreword in particular, which is, which is absolutely, it's completely nailed this, this problem of climate change and human society. I'd like to read a small extract from Ranjit's foreword. Um, it goes like this. Despite the robust anti-colonial movements of the mid 20th century and the various expressions of popular resistance across the second half of the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st, this vampirical global system, is referring to capitalism, has remained entrenched as the dominant paradigm of human organization. Worse, it has been replicated and expanded by the formerly subjugated regions of the world, newly free to pursue their own destinies yet trapped within the old narrative. It is against the tyranny, the delusional and self-destructive tyranny of the system that we take a stand in this anthology, beautifully and sensitively brought together by Vinita Agarwal, Open Your Eyes, calls from its resonant title onward for an urgent awakening to the crisis in which humankind finds itself. It calls also for a new attentiveness to what remains magical and mysterious about our world. And it summons us to a re-enchantment of all that has been violated and rendered desolate. Open Your Eyes offers the world a diverse and persuasive polyphony of voices to disregard which would spell insanity. The poets and prose writers who have contributed to this anthology are voices of wisdom, despair, love, courage, and hope. From the prospect of ruin, they recall us to the possibility of redemption, to a place natural and human potentiality in the emancipated from the clutches of the vampire. In the memorable opening line of Robert McFarlane's Underland, they remind us that the way into the Underland is through the riven trunk of an old ash tree. Close quote. 
we ignore them at our absolute peril. Thank you, Ranjit, for that very powerful validation. Um, coming also to my own preface to the book, uh, when I started the book very early in 2020, there was no inkling that we were going to enter into a pandemic. And by the time the book was released in September, uh, September 2020, uh, the pandemic was at, at its peak. The coronavirus had taken over the entire world and COVID was uh, a very real threat. So in putting that in context, I write in my preface that the pandemic has once again brought within the ambit of our existence animals, birds, fresh air and reduced noise pollution. The temporary cessation of man's activities as a result of the lockdown have given us back all the gifts of nature, which only proves that in the course of our ordinary existence, there is something grievously wrong with the way of our life. In our natural world, the issues of climate catastrophe and species extinction is a priority. Stories related to pollution, greenhouse gases, the depleting ozone layer, glacier meltdowns, etc. have turned pivotal if we are to attempt to salvage what's left of our Earth. We as readers, writers and responsible citizens need to take the threats of our environment very seriously. And even as I say this and record this, I am reminded of the terrible catastrophe of a glacier meltdown in Uttarakhand just two days ago, which led to devastation and loss of human life. So it's, it's happening. It's really, really happening. I would like to move on now to an eco-sattva prayer. Um, you know, we may say prayers to an, or a superior power if we are believers someone up there. But here is a little verse like a prayer composed in collaboration between Joanna Macy and One Earth Sangha's co-founders Kristen Barker and Lou Leonard. It's an eco sattva prayer which is dedicated to living in a healing way and, and living in a way that benefits the earth and doesn't destroy it. And I liked it very, very much and I would like to share it with all of you. Based on my love of the world and understanding of deep interdependence of all things, I vow to live in earth more lightly and less violently on the food, products and energy I consume. To commit myself daily to the healing of the world and the welfare of all beings, to discern and replace human systems of oppression and harm, to invite personal discomfort as an opportunity to share in the challenge of our collective liberation, to draw inspiration, strength and guidance from the living earth, from our ancestors and the future generations and from our siblings of all species. To help others in their work for the world and to ask for help when I feel the need to pursue a daily spiritual practice that clarifies my mind, strengthens my heart and supports me in observing these vows. Siblings from all species, how beautiful is that and how true. I will mention who's composed this um, in the comment section after I've uploaded the video. And if you could all just say this prayer when we wake up every morning. I'm sure we'll be in a better state of mind at least to cultivate good habits that will save the earth and our environment. I would like to talk a little about Arpita Joshi's NGO. She's the she's the founder of TCC and she's I'll, I'll put a link to her um, website as well in the comment section. So She's been writing about um, waste management, particularly in Mumbai. And she talks about this, this uh, landfill, which is so, which is almost 21 story high. And it's led to this dystopian life society, if you could call it a society of workers who manage that, not manage, but who 
uh, ravage through that waste and, and you know pick out stuff every morning and they know that whole landfill which is full of garbage and waste like the back of their hand and I found it extremely moving to read about it and she says that um, every time the monsoons uh, arrive in Mumbai with the, all the heavy rain that happens every year and, and the floods that follow it is this landfill and the garbage and the dump from here that enters into the homes of people who live in um, in nearby areas or in you know low lying areas in houses that are not uh, high enough to prevent the water from entering. So maybe I can just read out a little passage from her essay, which I found very very moving and very relevant. In in the way that informal waste economy and cities work, the landfill had been subsumed on all its sides by communities that made a living from it or were too poor to live elsewhere. In 2014, it was reported that it had reached the height of an 18-storey building. I stand corrected, 18-storey, not 21. Where old cities were built around grand monuments of hope and striving, the city of recent years cowered around this gigantic monument of waste. Women, men and children traversed it end to end, sometimes barefoot, knowing it like the back of their hands. The same gloveless hands that scored its surface of for recyclables, fetching them a bare living. Often adults and children I met nonchalantly discussed its landscapes like a minefield to be negotiated. The dangers of methane buildups and fires a constant worry. The dumping ground and the people around it were inextricably woven into one fabric of a dystopian life that took my 20-year-old self by shock then. So this is another aspect that we all need to take very seriously. Not only need, do we need to live more cleanly, like the prayer said, but also manage the waste really well so that it doesn't end up like this and uh, damage one whole section of our society. Uh, it gives me great pleasure now to read something from the book. Um, Ruth Padel's poems on water, which are a part of uh, Open Your Eyes, look at water, at the shortage of water from, from a multi-dimensional perspective. And she's divided them into short poems, each looking at a particular dimension. So the first one is titled Water Wars. Do you know where you are in the Milky Way? Look for the spun bud of the whirlpool, the last struggle of the water butterfly in toxic red mud, all that is left of your river when they extract the aluminium, which will connect your SIM card with the world. The second one is titled Water Connects. You hear the plink of stalactites, iTunes in sea melt, Leaks from the conscious mind. A gush from the pericardial sac and swollen jelly heart. Now it's the water closet, the one truly fortified space where the orator prepares his lecture undisturbed because reality is not quite real enough till pushed through the mesh of words. The third one is water is identity. I am easily lost. I am different in different places, shifting away to unhaloed ground you don't think to protect. I am what you don't recognize by any other name. The scarlet fleck in the black and white stone eye of Shiva set fast in the Himalaya, a swamp cloud of mosquitoes swarming through the veil of health. All the questions about origins and home you have, never let yourself ask. I can't help but read Ranjit Hoskote's poem in the book, which is titled Sovereign, which is about um, the meltdown of the Ar Arctics and the Antarctics and how it affects. It's also about species extinction in a way. Plucking sunsets from the water, the horned sovereign half stamps, half slides, 
Across the beach, stopping to dig, claw, rake. What washes up is drilled shale, lost static parsed from gulf to strait, plastic whirls in whose wake gaggled dolphins trail scarred humpback whales whose shadows will drift unmoored up thawing glaciers. What washes up is news of the cracked ice across which a shivering fox is making her way from Svalbard to Nunavut, leaving her paw prints on frozen currents to a shore stippled with burst nebulae, a shore that on a compass dizzy with wind-scattered directions she can and can't call home.